brothers and sisters in Christ, we are now in the Cathedral of the Good Shepherd, Singapore, and so let us begin. Prayers for forgiveness and healing before the Blessed Sacrament. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as we are before the Lord who is present to us in the Blessed Sacrament, truly and physically, after each prayer, let us allow the words to sink into our hearts. Heavenly Father, I come before you with an open heart to receive your graces, to forgive those who have hurt me deeply. May you heal me 
and, and give me the strength to be more like you at all times. Forgive me for the times when I have taken your love and mercy for granted. Father, you know my needs and you feel my pain, trials and helplessness. Be my strength and my hope, so that I can forgive as you forgive, and find the peace of seeing and loving you in every person daily. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us begin with our guided contemplation of the Gospels. To familiarize with the Gospel text of our contemplation, I will now read the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, verse 1 to 15, which is on the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Jesus went off to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, and a large crowd followed him. Impressed by the signs he gave by curing the sick, Jesus climbed the hillside and sat down there with his disciples. It was shortly before the Jewish feast of Passover. Looking up, Jesus saw the crowd approaching and said to Philip, Where can we buy some bread for these people to eat? He only said this to test Philip. He himself knew exactly what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 denarii would only buy enough to give them a small piece of bread. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a small boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, 
but what is that between so many? Jesus said to them, Make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass there, and as many as 5,000 men sat down. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and gave them out to all who were sitting ready. He then did the same with the fish, giving out as much as was wanted. When they had eaten enough, he said to his disciples, Pick up the pieces left over, so that nothing gets wasted. So they picked them up and filled twelve hampers with scraps left over from the meal of five barley loaves. The people seeing this sign that he had given said, This really is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus could see they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, escape back to the hills by himself. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, I will now give you a few pointers on the gospel that we just heard proclaimed to help us have a better understanding of God's word and also to prepare our hearts for our guided contemplation prayer. The crowds had interpreted the miraculous multiplication of the loaves as Jesus being the awaited prophet who is to come after Moses and so they wanted to make Jesus their king. The grass on the hillside echoes Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd who makes me lie down in green pastures, and who Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. The actual feeding of the multitudes echoes the Synoptic Gospels account of the institution of the Eucharist. While the twelve basket full of leftovers of bread is the first indication in the Gospel of the twelve apostles whom Jesus will choose as his inner core companions for his public ministry. For our contemplation, we could take up the generous gesture of the young boy who offered his five loaves and two fish to Andrew the Apostle. Jesus then asked his apostle to get the great crowd to sit on the grass. He then took what was offered, blessed them, and then distribute, distributed them to the crowd. He did the same with the fish. Jesus accepted what was offered by the boy to feed the 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and had 12 baskets full of leftovers. As we reflect on this episode, let us remember that Jesus performed the miracle precisely from the generosity of the young boy, who decided to offer all that he had, little though it may be compared to the large hungry crowd. The young boy, in all probability, having heard about Jesus being a miraculous healer, and then having heard Jesus preach with great wisdom, and trusted all he had to Jesus whom he believed could bring much good out of what he offers. My brothers and sisters in Christ, let us too be reminded that you and I too have been blessed in different ways by God. Regardless of who we are and whatever struggles and sufferings we may be going through, God has not forgotten us and has blessed us abundantly. Like the young boy, you and I are called to offer the blessings we have in our lives, whatever they may be, to God in ways that the Holy Spirit may inspire us. We too are called to affirm the truth that whatever we offer to God willingly and happily, like the young boy's offering, God will be able to use them for the good and salvation of all peoples. And there's no amount that is too small that God will not accept from us. In fact, it is not the amount that we offer that matters, but what we offer with sincerity of heart and love for Jesus is what really matters to Him. My sisters and brothers in Christ, God looks at our hearts and He knows exactly the quality and the generosity of our offering. The more we love Jesus, the more selfless and generous you and I will be and become. 
the less we love Jesus, the less we will offer him. And the more we will rationalize what we give and how much we are offering to him. I will now present some pointers for the guided contemplation. My brothers and sisters in Christ, in the earlier sessions of our guided contemplation, I mentioned the importance of creating a suitable ambience for our prayer. I also mentioned that as I guide you along the con contemplation, follow me only if you find what I am saying to be helpful. But if the Holy Spirit is to guide you personally, then simply ignore what I'm saying. I also mentioned that there will be moments of silence which are deliberate. These moments are very important parts of the contemplation because they are to give you sacred space to listen and feel the promptings of the Holy Spirit, however this may be. And if you wish to have more details of the structure of this guided contemplation and also to listen to the introduction for part one of this series, please click on to the button at the bottom of this video. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, having prepared ourselves to familiarize with the gospel text that we are to contemplate on, we can now begin our contemplation. May I ask you to switch off your mobile phones and close your eyes and begin to compose yourself by first focusing your attention on your nostrils. Become aware of your breathing, the air that is entering your nostrils. Feel the air entering your lungs and giving you life. Every breath you take is God's precious gift of life to you. So be grateful to God for the gift of life. It is God who is keeping you alive. For as soon as you stop breathing, you will die. The God who gives you the gift of life is present within your hearts and is loving you personally and intimately. Get in touch with God's infinite love within you and thank the Lord for everything. Prayer to pray for the graces we need for our contemplation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to contemplate this gospel of the multiplication of the loaves and fish. We ask you to send us your Holy Spirit to enlighten our darkened minds and open our selfish hearts more widely to become more like the young boy in the gospel so that we can love you more wholeheartedly. Imagine yourself at the scene of the gospel where you are with the disciples and Jesus on the hillside facing a great multitude of crowds.
Jesus must have been preaching and relating to the crowd and now he's aware that they are all hungry and need to be fed. So his heart is filled with compassion for their needs. Jesus too is fully aware of your present needs. Get in touch with your present needs. Allow your present needs to surface within your heart. And get in touch with your inner feelings. sense at the same time that Jesus knows your needs and is feeling compassionate towards you. Just then, Andrew the Apostle comes forward to Jesus and says, Lord, there is this young boy who has offered his five loaves and two fish to you. Jesus looks at the young boy with love and appreciation and goes up to him and embraces him for his generosity and then blesses him. Jesus then asked you and the other disciples to get the great crowd to sit on the grass. When the people were seated, Jesus asked, takes the five barley loaves and blesses them and then passes them over to you and the disciples to distribute. As you put the loaves into the basket, you were greatly surprised to see that now the basket is filled with bread. Feeling great joy in your heart, you and your disciples begin to distribute the bread to everyone. The more you give out the bread, the more bread there are to be given out. And you are filled with awe and joy in your heart. When everyone has received the bread they need, Jesus takes the two fish and likewise blesses them and then passes them to you 
and the disciples. In your great astonishment, the fish, like the bread, fills up the basket. And the more you give out the fish to the people, the more fish they are. They can only have come from the blessings of Jesus. When this miracle was happening, the young boy was jumping for joy and he thanked Jesus for feeding everyone. While the people were eating, you and the disciples sit in silence. You are each pondering on what is actually happening. Then the young boy caught your eyes. He continues to be filled with great joy. Then as you look into your own heart, you begin to realize that you have not been jumping for joy because the abundant blessings that God has given you, unlike the boy, you have kept Jesus' blessing selfishly to yourself. You were blinded by your blessings and always had excuses to keep them for yourself and your family. For you loved yourself too much and convinced yourself that the needs of others are not of your concern. Moreover, Jesus too have blessed you with good health, many talents, and ample time at your disposal. Have you used them for the good of God's people? Or have you conveniently rationalized that you have done enough for the needs of others? Jesus looks into your eyes and you feel within your heart that he's inviting you to be detached from the material securities of this world. You are only need is to be attached to Jesus as your true security and Lord.
become aware that you are now leaving the gospel scene and become conscious that you are in your room where you are praying at this moment. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may open your eyes now. My brothers and sisters in Christ, St. Ignatius of Loyola reminds us that soon after our contemplative prayer, we are to do a review of our prayer experiences. This review only takes, needs to take some five minutes or so. The purpose of this review of prayer is to recall and relish what happened during the prayer. As such, during this prayer review, get in touch with your inner feelings during the contemplation and describe your experiences. Dear brothers and sisters, we shall now move on for our benediction. given them bread from heaven. Having in itself all delight. Let us pray. O God, in this wonderful sacrament, you have left us a memorial of your passion. We ask you to enable us so to worship the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, as we may constantly feel in our lives the effects of your redemption, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen.
my brothers and sisters in Christ, as mentioned in our earlier session, while it is essential that we use the precious gift of freedom that God our Father, the Creator, has given us to develop our relationship with Him, the next important theme to reflect on, which we will take up today, is what kind of God are we believing in? This is an important question for us to reflect on as we begin because we cannot presume that you and I have a healthy image and wholesome relationship with God. Each of us have a different relationship with God. And the reason why we all have a different relationship with God is because our experiences of God are all so very different. Some of us are cradle Catholics, like myself, who are brought up in the faith together with the rest of our family, where we experience the faith as very much part of our lives and daily living. For us to pray the rosary together as a family and to go for Sunday masses and to live the moral teachings of the church is of second nature to us. The Catholic Church's teachings we see and accept as good for us and are not rigid laws in any way to be followed. We can see that our faith experiences would be very different from a Catholic who is converted as an adult and who lives with his or her family who are not Catholics. The challenges of their faith would be very different from the traditional Catholics. There are many other types of Catholic Christians too, but regardless of whether we are cradle Catholic Christians or whether we are converts, the context and environment within which we experience our Catholic faith have a very strong influence on the way we live our faith daily. We may say that while some of us have a strong and healthy faith, Others may describe their faith as somewhat confusing and complex, while still others may consider, consider their faith to be unimportant and reject the Catholic Church's teaching to be unacceptable. Many Catholics consider the moral teachings and the moral values of the Church to be too demanding. This is especially so when it comes to the obligation to attend Sunday Masses and on holiday of obligation and to hold and uphold the Gospels of Christ by living the Ten Commandments and the moral values of fidelity to marriage, vocation to the priesthood and religious life. The sacredness of the gift of life from the time of conception in a mother's womb to the time at which we are dying all human lives belong to God, who is our Creator, and only God in His providence can decide how long we are to live on this earth. And as such, no person has the right to end a human person's life, whether it is abortion, euthanasia, scientific testing, ethnic cleansing, or capital punishment and the like. These and other moral teachings of the Church are very much part of the living of the Gospel that Jesus proclaimed that all believers are to uphold as part of their belief in Jesus, who is our Lord and Saviour of our lives. As we reflect on our earlier sessions, our identity as a human person is that you and I and every human being is a precious child of God. And that is precisely why, as a human person, we have in all circumstances and situations must defend the right to live and to protect the integrity of the human person and accord full respect, care, justice and love to all peoples, regardless of their race, rank in society, religion and creed they profess, whether they are healthy or sick, 
wealthy or poor or marginalized, in the womb or aged, every person has a human dignity given to him and her by God, who created all human beings out of his love and in his image and likeness. My sisters and brothers in Christ, the living of our faith and our fidelity to God's will through living the gospel of Christ, as mentioned, is full of challenges. How then do we have the wisdom and strength to live God's will, especially in times of challenges and trials and temptations that lure us to give up our faith and vocation? Let us take this true story to help us appreciate what fidelity to the faith can demand from us and who God is in times of such challenges. When Jasmine, not her real name, got married to Richard, not his real name, Richard's mother, for reasons unknown to Jasmine, somehow hates her as the daughter-in-law. Jasmine tries to live, love her mother-in-law as best as she can, yet she still cannot appease her daily frustrations and anger towards Jasmine. Richard, a good husband, is helpless. Every night, when everyone has gone to bed, Jasmine would light a votive candle and kneel before the images of Jesus and Our Lady and cry. She will cry every night and ask God for the needed light of what she has done wrong for her mother-in-law to hate her. And what else can she do to help her mother-in-law accept and love her? This went on every night for 20 years. After the 20th year, Jasmine's mother-in-law got very sick and was bedridden. Jasmine continued to nurse and care for her with great devotion and love. Even then, her mother-in-law continued to reject her. After five years of being bedridden, Jasmine's mother-in-law knew that she was going to die. So one day, she asked Jasmine, Why is it that you continue to love me for the past 25 years with so much care and patience, even though I do not love you? Jasmine responded, Because Jesus wants me to love you. Hearing that response, Jasmine's mother-in-law, for the first time, broke down and cried uncontrollably. She then said to Jasmine, In that case, I too want to know and love Jesus. Jasmine hugged her mother-in-law and both cried. And with joy, she then asked for baptism and embraced the Catholic faith before she died. My brothers and sisters in Christ, while no person wants pain, living our faith with fidelity can demand that you and I have to go beyond the pains and the trials and the sufferings in our lives by trusting in the Lord and by drawing strength from the Lord as Jasmine has shown us. For this God of ours will never fail us and will always give us the strength we need. The challenges of our lives, like that of Jasmine, can be agonizing. But yet, Jasmine, you and I are called to hold on to God, who will never fail us. I see never fail Jasmine, and continue to give her the wisdom to trust Him, regardless of how dark and painful and how long it was for her. In Jasmine's discerning heart, her mother-in-law was still a precious daughter of God. And so she was able to still see the face of Jesus in her mother-in-law, who to her may be suffering. As such, she felt called 
to continue to love her mother-in-law each day at a time. If Jasmine was not a discerning person, she would have given up on her mother-in-law and also possibly her husband and even her children too. And her mother-in-law would in all probability have not been converted and found Christ in the Catholic faith. Today, Jasmine continues to live a very fulfilling, happy and holy life as a wife, mother and grandmother. And she is all forgiving towards all the suffering she bore with her mother-in-law. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, in the next session, we will continue to reflect further on our understanding of God our Father and perhaps take up the theme of God's mercy and compassionate love for us. Thank you for your attention. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the gift of your Son who is present before us in a physical and true way in the Blessed Sacrament. We thank you for giving your Son to us who revealed his divinity through the multiplication of loaves that shows us how much compassion and mercy he has for all our needs, and most especially, the salvation of all of mankind. We thank you for being able to contemplate the miracle of the multiplication of loaf, and may you continue to give us the graces and the wisdom to live your will with greater fidelity and generosity of heart. And so we pray, Lord, teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to seek for reward, save that of knowing I do your most holy will Amen.